Thank you. Um, so let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation and uh, to apologize for, for not being there in person, unfortunately. So in the 30, I thought plus epsilon or maybe minus epsilon <laughs> minutes I have, I will try to give a broad brush picture of one particular corner of this gravitational wave frontier, the ultra relativistic corner. And let me start by uh, giving some reasons why I'm interested in that corner. If I can scroll, which I can't, why? Oh, la, la. oh. okay, fine. So um, you all know that even neglecting spin, the two body scattering problem in GR has a large parameter space. We may take its coordinates as the two masses, the total angular momentum, the total energy in the center of mass. And if we take the classical limit, h bar goes to zero, then uh, GR has no intrinsic length or mass scale and physical observables can only depend non-trivially on three independent ratios or dimensionless quantities. So if you use G equals C equal one units, then we may take them to be the ratio, say, of the, each mass to the impact parameter, the velocity, or different combinations like this famous uh, symmetric ratio, uh, mass ratio nu. Now, observables such as the deflection angle, time delay, waveforms, memory, radiated energy do depend in a complicated way on all these variables. And the full problem is, of course, very hard. So one looks at limits in which it simplifies. Now, two of them have been investigated for a long time. The post-Newtonian expansion, which is in powers of V over C, the probe limit expansion, which is new is small, say the, the ratio of the two masses is small. Now, a more recent popular expansion is the one in powers of Newton's constant, uh, is the so-called post-Minkowskian expansion, uh, which is supposedly exact in V and new at each order in G. It is close somehow to the particle physicist heart, like me, since it corresponds to the loop expansion in quantum field theory. And actually the high energy community has been interested in gravitational two body problem since the late eighties, although with completely different motivations. One was to see the emergence of classical and quantum gravity through thought experiments in flat space time. Two, to construct a unitary S matrix which would describe the formation and decay of a black hole in, for instance, a string-string collision. Of course, if one would succeed, one would have a solution to Hawking's information puzzle. Now, in that context, light particle, light string collision, having transplancian energy, uh, high velocities is needed for the collision to be able to form a black hole which is larger than the Planck length. And this transplancian energy also allows to justify, in that case, a semi-classical approximation. So this URL, which is ultra relativistic limit, not the uniform resource locator, is unavoidable. But what we missed completely at the time is that in some limit, massive astrophysical black holes can be thought of as elementary particles. They have no hair, so they have just mass and spin like an elementary particle. Of course, for black holes, the non-relativistic or mildly relativistic regimes are the most relevant ones. And so one would be tempted to say that we can forget about the ultra-relativistic limit. So my answer is no. And I share this answer with uh, Thibaut Damour because uh, some five years ago, he argued that useful input for the two body problem, in particular for the EOB approach, can be obtained from the ultra relativistic limit of gravitational scattering and gave examples, one I will show below. Now, giving other examples of these uh, um, lessons from the ultra relativistic frontier will be the main aim of this talk. 
And this possibility rests on an essential property of gravity, the absence of collinear singularities, which makes the massless limit well-defined as explained in a um, very old paper by Steve Weinberg. Now the massless point particle limit on its own has a one dimensional parameter space, which is given just by the ratio of the center of mass energy to the impact parameter, or if you want the deflection angle. But as we will see, one surprise, at least for me, I don't know for you, is that the ultra relativistic frontier is much richer than that and has at, is at least uh, three dimensional. Now, the outline is roughly like this. I will first discuss the ultra relativistic limit in connection with the deflection angle, particularly a 3 p.m. order. Then I will move on to radiation, talking about a couple of energy crises um, and their partial resolution. I will introduce what we would like to call a kovacs storm bound. Then I will present some very recent work. So, so, so far is rather old stuff, let's say. Then I will uh, talk about a paper which just came out where we propose an improved iconal operator in the soft graviton limit. Uh, I will not uh, discuss waveforms and memory, leaving it to Carlo Heisenberg's uh, talk. And I will instead discuss this rich ultraviolet frontier and some non-analyticity in Newton's constant that we find. And then at the very end, I will mention some ongoing work going beyond the soft radiation limit. So let me start with a reminder. Uh, uh, the, the elastic uh, scattering amplitude uh, is characterized semi-classically by an iconal phase, which we call 2 delta uh, conventionally, which itself has an expansion in Newton's constant. And that's the main object we are after. Now, that um, uh, delta gives the scattering angle and the Shapiro time delay as derivatives of real delta with respect to the impact parameter and energy respectively. On the other hand, if there are inelastic channels that open up, like Bremsstrahlung radiation, then uh, im2 delta is not zero, is bigger than zero, and uh, it, uh, it corresponds to opening inelastic channel and to the consequent suppression of the elastic one. Now, uh, in 1990, uh, we, uh, with Amati and Cefaloni, we had results up to the 3 p.m. order. So at 1 p.m., one finds the, a very standard result, a classical, a, a real delta, uh, which gives the generalization of Einstein's deflection formula to relativistic collisions. At 2 p.m., that's the first surprise, there is no classical limit. You see the classical quantity has to scale for delta as 1 over h bar, and there is no 1 over h bar in real delta 1. And so this was actually Damour's first use of this ultra-relativistic limit, because the ultra-relativistic limit has to go to zero at 2 p.m. in the classical limit, although it is not at all zero uh, outside the ultra-relativistic limit. Then uh, we went to 3 p.m., or to loops, and we found a perfectly finite uh, uh, a real part of delta two, which gives a correction to the deflection angle, and a classical uh, but divergent uh, imaginary part of delta two, corresponding to uh, Bremsstrahlung processes. And there is both a log S, as you see, and a log lambda, which is the infrared cutoff. Or you can use dim reg and have one over epsilon. Never mind. Uh, now, the puzzle at 3 p.m. is the following. Uh, uh, three years ago already, wow, time passes, uh, an impressive calculation by Byrne and and collaborators indicated at the bottom of the slide led to the first 3 p.m. result for two mass six scalars in, in GR. 
it was checked to be consistent up to 6 p.m. Uh, integer p.m. order, but presented a puzzle. If you took the high energy or just the massless limit of their result, it exhibited a logarithmic divergence in contrast with the finite result by our group. Now, uh, how was the argument of ACV uh, uh, going at zero mass? It combined real analyticity of the scattering amplitude, some statement about the asymptotics, which leads to fixed T dispersion relations with some subtract subtractions, crossing symmetry, and perturbative unitarity. Then we computed the imaginary part of delta two from the inelastic three particle cut of the two loop amplitude. And when you use all the other ingredients, this, this gives, gave the quoted result for real delta two from this relation that we could prove, connecting the real part to the imaginary part and to some lower order uh, contribution. Now, the logarithmically growing term in M delta two, of course, cancels against the one over log, so that disappears, still has an infrared divergence, the log lambda, which however cancels against the delta zero term, and this is what gave the finite result for real delta two. In contrast, the Bernetals in delta two grows like log square s, and this implies their infamous log S in real delta two. So in, uh, in that paper, our collaboration extended the uh, Amati Cefaloni and myself argument to massive uh, ultra relativistic case. It confirmed the same result. And then finally it was confirmed by computing the full amplitude, including the real part, but in a simplified setup of n equal eight massive supergravity, including contribution from the full soft then rather than just the potential integration region. And uh, this was the result which shows the new terms. Uh, uh, this cancels the log which comes from the arc cosh. And uh, this extra new term is what gives the uh, ACV limit correctly. And one should uh, notice that new and old terms behave quite different in their PN expansion, which corresponds to sigma going to one, but cancel precisely as you can see in the ultra relativistic limit. And when uh, we gave a presentation of this in August uh, 20, uh, Damour immediately grasped the physical meaning of what we had found. We had found basically an effect of radiation reaction, which uh, made everything now consistent. A couple of months later, using a smart shortcut, Damour extended our result to actual GR. I'll show the result in a moment. And a bit later, using another shortcut, our group gave another simple derivation of both the n equal zero and n equal eight result for the radiation reaction. And more confirmations were given last year by extracting the radiation reaction from full-fledged two-loop calculations. This is the, the result in GR, which is, is more complicated, but has a very similar structure. And, uh, and the cancellation works. And uh, summing up these numbers, you get the 16 sigma square, which leads precisely to the same result as in n equal eight. So it gives a universality of the result in the massless limit. Now, I will not talk about this. These are the two other, two shortcuts which I was discussing in a moment, but for both I refer to Carlos' talk later today. Now, uh, new challenges at 4 p.m. I will skip it because of, of time. Uh, I, I have not followed, uh, unfortunately, I fell asleep. I couldn't follow <laughs> Julio's talk yesterday, so maybe there is new progress. But I'm pretty sure that having control of the ultra relativistic limit is also very important there. So now let's move to the second part, uh, which is gravitational radiation and a bunch of energy crises. So the first crisis came out um, from a paper we wrote in 07 uh, with Amati and Cefaloni, 
where we were getting a graviton spectrum which was too hard. It had a very nice transverse momentum cutoff, but not a sufficiently strong energy cutoff. So the, the gravitons would come out very collinear to the, to the beams, but, uh, but with too much energy. And that gave you know, the, the energy emitted in gravitons uh, of a square root of S was becoming one, even at small uh, even at large impact parameters or small deflection angle. Now, the problem was basically solved following two approaches, which are completely different. One is a classical GR calculation that I did with uh, Andrei Gruzinov in 14. And then there was an amplitude based, therefore, quantum calculation with a lot of C's and myself, Vesi, uh, Ciafaloni, Colfera, and myself. And uh, to our amazement, the two approaches gave exactly the same result in the classical limit. I have to stress that both are limited to small deflection angles, so large impact parameter, and also small emission angle, detection angle for the gravitational wave. So just remember theta s is the deflection angle, theta is the angle at which the gravitational wave uh, arrives to the detector. Now, I will just flash the formula because of time I don't have, uh, I cannot explain all the ingredients, but it's just to stress that it's an explicit formula for the differential energy spectrum, both in frequency and in, in, in angle. Uh, in solid angle, and it's very explicit, it's finite, and you can put it in a computer, rapidly oscillating, so it's not trivial, but it can be done. Now, instead of explaining the formula, I will show the result. And I will only show the uh, main point, which the spectrum has a hawking like knee that I will explain. It has also an unexpected bump, a small bump, which I will not talk about. So the main point is the following. If you look at the spectrum in an intermediate frequency region between one over B, B is the input parameter, and one over R, R is G times energy. In that region, there is a, logarithm, a slow logarithmic decrease of the spectrum. However, that log doesn't propagate down to omega equals zero. When omega becomes smaller than b to the minus one, it freezes to the value it has at omega equal one over b. R over b is the, is the deflection angle. So we find that in the, uh, frequ in the zero frequency limit of ZFL, we reproduce the expected result with a log, with an expected log of theta s squared. Now, the interesting thing is that if you go above one over r, then the uh, the spectrum starts to drop. This is the this is the knee, and one over r is the typical frequency of a Hawking radiation at uh, for a black hole of mass r. So, and this is uh, showing the result and actually the, the spectra fall on a universal curve if you rescale the spectrum by this factor, but then at, at, at low energy, you see, at low frequency, you see this logarithmic dependence on the scattering angle. Now, uh, unfortunately, a spectrum which falls down like one over omega, you cannot integrate it up to infinity, so this scale invariant spectrum gives a log omega star sensitivity if the cutoff is omega equal omega star. And with some motivation, we argue that our approximation break down at this scale. And in this way, we got, you see, a rather nice result for the total yield in gravitational wave energy of the square root of S, which is small, of course, the, the theta, theta square. Now, so the, this ultra-relativistic uh, energy crisis is almost solved. We need to go beyond some approximations to be sure, which are made in, in those papers, find the actual value of omega star, which we, we could only guess, and also extend the method to arbitrary theta. And I will have more to say later. 
But let me say that even before embarking in those non-trivial calculations of the ultra-relativistic limit, we, meaning Kruzinov and myself, checked the literature and asked some experts, including numerical relativity guys. And each time, after some initial optimism, you know, like people say, oh, oh, that must be a trivial problem, I'll give you an answer next week, then uh, in, in practice, the feedback was disappointing. Instead, we found that Kovacs and Thorne had already put a nice warning on the limit of validity of their general uh, result. And, and that uh, limit is that the scattering angle should be smaller than one over this, uh, this gamma factor, uh, uh, one over this Lorentz boost factor. And I will refer in the following uh, to this quantity, this product of um, the point at which the scattering angle times sigma to the one half is one as the KT bound. Although credit must be given also to Peter Diaz who discussed precisely this point, which corresponds to the KT bound when you make the, the precise translation and he even tried to go beyond, but he didn't dare to go to the massless limit. Now, there is a new incarnation of the energy crisis, and this is the calculation which was presented yesterday. I looked a little bit at the slides by um, Julio, which uh, their calculation, uh, Herman et al., has confirmed the KT result and it led to an energy crisis, which is similar to the one found in this uh, 07 paper, and which was solved there. Now, this is a flash of their result for the radiated energy. And if you look at the high sigma limit, you find that it goes like theta cube times square root of S, and there is also some new dependence. And this is another energy crisis if you keep the scattering angle fixed and you let the energy go to infinity. Notice that there is no extra log sigma, which would appear in both in this term and in this term, but at least the log sigma cancels, and this is a bit relevant for later. Now, uh, there was already a warning that some problem may be there in the 3 p.m. result even if you look at the zero frequency limit of the spectrum. Because if you take literally the zero frequency limit of the radiated energy, you find a log sigma. Now a log sigma is only a log, you can say, but still, if you send sigma to infinity and you keep theta fixed, that also uh, gives a problem. But fortunately, in this case, Weinberg and many others tell us how to fix this problem. Because one can directly study the zero frequency limit for massless scattering. And as we have already seen, the result is quite different. And it's finite. It is very similar, but instead of a log of sigma, there is a log of theta scattering to the minus two. And the two things become the same precisely at the KT bound. Now, the price to pay for this finiteness is that the result is non-polynomial in G, because remember that the scattering angle is proportional to G, and the log of G is not analytic in G. Now, um, now what did we do um, more recently? Well, when radiation is included, when we want to include radiation, the iconal phase needs to be upgraded to an emission operator in order to account for inelastic channels while preserving unitarity. This at least is my philosophy. The above puzzles pushed us to propose an iconal, an iconal operator which implicitly contains some resummation of perturbation theory, therefore reproducing the correct zero frequency limit and possibly we think will be, can be valid even far beyond the zero frequency limit. And I really? sketch, yes. Sorry, five minutes? Yes, okay, I think I'm doing fine. 
Uh, so uh, what we did, we started for Weinberg's soft theorem in momentum space, and you know Weinberg's theorem in momentum space means multiply the the bare amplitude by some factor, so it involves a multiplication by the soft factor, and then go to B space by Fourier transform, and of course you get a convolution from a product. And uh, uh, doing carefully the convolution, we arrive at the following operator iconal. So there is an exponential of uh, creation annihilation operator, but it's an emission operator uh, in the exponent. It's an anti-emission operator in the exponent, therefore it's a unitary operator, which acts on the full um, uh, iconal, uh, real part of the iconal. With a very interesting point, the prescription for this F tilde because we are now in B space. So the F tilde here is only explicitly showing the K dependence, the momentum of the graviton, this creation of annihilation of the graviton. But of course, it depends on all the momenta of the process, in particular on the momentum transfer. And the prescription that you have to use for Q minus IH bar DDB, which then act on this um, two delta, now, two delta has a one over h bar, and therefore you see that when you when you when you act with this operator, it amounts to simply replacing small q, which would be in perturbation theory a quantum object, with big Q, which is nothing but the classical momentum transfer in the process, which becomes h bar independent. At this point, we can compute various radiative observables like the waveforms, the linear memory, and the radiated energy spectrum for the moment in the soft limit, but at arbitrary center of mass velocities for the process. And let me concentrate on the latter, the energy spectrum. Uh, more will be in uh, Carlos' talk. So this is the Last, if you want slide, then there are some pictures. So there is a rich structure of the ultraviolet, ultra relativistic limit emerging. The zero frequency limit depends non trivially on two scaling variables, the ratios of Q over MI, there is a factor of two for convenience. One combination is, of course, related to new if you take the ratio. The other is new. For instance, you can take it to be this famous theta scattering square times sigma, if you want the square of the bound of the KT bound. Now, the dependence on G is non-analytic, and the post-Minkowskian expansion in powers of G, or equivalently of the Xi, because Q contains G, has a finite radius of convergence, which is given precisely by X1 equal 1, X2 equal 1. The reason, I mean, we, we found it very recently, is that there is a singularity at some unphysical point in this space. Um, but of course, the singularity determines the radius of convergence of, of the series. And the singularity is that at x i square equal one minus one, which has a very simple interpretation. It corresponds to T channel threshold. If you look at the T-channel of the process, you can have two uh, heavy, <laughs> heavy light, in our case, uh, particle of mass M1, or, or two particles of mass M2. And so this defines now quantitatively the KT bound. And only the truly massless limit, when the MI are both much smaller than Q, so the limit xi goes to infinity is universal. Now, this is a picture with Mathematica showing really how this uh, power series diverge. This is the true answer. This, this, this is, uh, is d, d theta, and nu equal one quarter. And this is this variable x. Now x1 is equal to x2, and they call it x. So you see that at, at very small x, which means uh, small q's, large mass, if you want, then this works well. But as you go to towards large x, this starts to differ a lot. In fact, 
you know, the more terms you put, the, the worse you do, typically of a divergent series. And here you see also that the other expansion in one over X fails. Uh, it, I mean, it works, of course, a large X, but now it fails a small X. These are just to flash the results. So we have in the, in the soft limit, we have explicit results. And in terms of the scaling variables, they're written here for GR and here for, uh, uh, for n equal eight. Uh, as you see, they are pretty different, but if you send both Xi to infinity, you know, to the truly massless limit, then you recover universality. And these are the very last slides. The, the URL, you can try to go beyond the zero frequency limit. This is something we are uh, preparing now, working on. We have only considered in this case the leading order in theta s. Previously, you could also take big scattering angle, but here, no, we are, we are limited. We find a fast fall off about precisely the omega star that we guessed with, uh, with Kruzinov and appears to be confirmed. And I end up with a table summarizing the situation. Of course, it takes a little while to to explain the table, and I'm also not very good at preparing tables. Uh, so this is the zero frequency limit or the soft limit that we discussed already. I told you about the log of omega square r square, which is this quantity in this intermediate frequency region. Well, we checked that our formula gives a very similar behavior where instead of theta s to the minus two, you get sigma. So the same vocabulary works here and works here. Now we are studying, that's why we haven't put out the paper yet, this last uh, part, which is the behavior, if you want, above the Hawking uh, point, or in, in the, if you are below the KT bound, above this particular frequency scale, because then above sigma to the three half, we find a nice exponential cutoff. So now there is a sharp omega star, as I was saying. And what is still puzzling a little bit is that we know from the work of Julio et al. that uh, in this regime, the, the total emitted energy goes like square root of sigma with no extra log sigma. On the other hand, in our, in the paper by, by my group, uh, we had theta square times log theta square. So we don't know whether the dictionary that works in this regime and in this regime fades in this regime, or maybe because we made some approximation in those two papers, there were some approximations that were not completely justified, and maybe this log is after all not there. And oh, really? okay. I, leave, We're over time. I leave up the conclusions uh, if you want to read, but um, uh, the only thing I would like to emphasize is that this ultra relativistic limit may have an interest of its on its own. And one thing is came just to my mind that ultra relativistic collisions of light particles in the very early, very hot universe may have generated an interesting stochastic background of gravitational waves. This was inspired by reading Weinberg's calculation of gravitational waves from uh, non relativistic thermal collisions in the sun. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, last comment, uh, having developed further our computational tools, maybe we should try to come back to this 35 years old goal of understanding how information is encoded in the S matrix for the collapse regime of trans Planckian energy collision. Thank you. Thank you. So Questions either from the audience or from Zoom World? Yeah. Hi, Gabriele. Thanks for a uh, very nice talk. It, this is Julio. Um, so I, I have a question about this non-analyticity in, in G. So you also yes. presented this iconal operator, which 
which includes all these soft emissions. And presumably that is just a resumation of these soft emission diagrams to all orders. That's right. Uh, That's right. But, Where, but you also yes. said that um, that there's something which is non-analytic and then we shouldn't see in, in a post-Minkowski post expansion. So yeah. does this mean that there is no set of diagrams that I can resum to get this, this log in G? Or? No, 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 no. This is actually the way uh, with, um, with, um, with, with, well, the, this is the way we did it either with Gruzinov in GR or with Chafaloni and company with amplitudes. So if you do resum things properly, you do get this non-analyticity. Now, what is clear is that if you work at fixed order in, in G, then you see uh, you have, a, 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 say, a G cube for the spectrum out in front, and then the spectrum does not know about G anymore, right? Because you have your G cube times a function of omega, B, and sigma. That's all you have. And, and therefore, the cutoff has to be only a function of B and sigma, cannot depend on G. So indeed, what, you, what we are saying is that you need to perform a resummation and that the final result is non-analytic in, in G. This was already clear in my calculation with Krusinov, and it was fully confirmed in the, in, in the approach, in the amplitude-based approach. I don't know if this was uh, is answering your question. Yeah, okay, so you're, you're saying if we do resum the soft emissions, we should see that the, the, the radiated energy uh, doesn't exceed the incoming energy and everything should be fine. Yeah, yeah, we, we believe that that's the case. Uh, now, as I was saying, what is crystal clear and certainly, you know, it's not an assumption is that if you take just the soft emission, not these hard gravitons which carry most of the energy. For instance, if you want to get your result, you need to go beyond the soft approximation. But already in the soft approximation, we know from Weinberg that, that the, we know what is the soft limit. And the soft limit has a log of the angle. In a massless case, the soft limit for gravity emission has a log theta. This is in many papers, including one by myself and Bianchi. Uh, because you get a log of S over T. And log of S over T is log of theta. So you will never get that by, you know, one loop, two loops. You have to read some diagrams. So that, and that's what we think our improved iconal actually does. Now, the question is, we get, of course, right the soft limit, but if you want, you can say, well, you cooked it in such a way as to get it. So the question is, can we go beyond and get something interesting? And already in this intermediate frequency region, we get something which was quite non-trivial to get because, you know, to get this log of omega r decrease, it, it, it's non-trivial, both in the classical calculation and in the amplitude calculation. Uh, now, even higher, it's even more tricky, but we have, we have nice uh, curves and results. Now we have to, 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 to do a little more work, but I'm pretty confident that we completely solve the problem of too much emission. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other question? This one. Hi, um, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, this is Josh and speaking. So oh, yeah. this Hi. is uh, maybe a question slash comment. So recently when we calculated the angular momentum at GQ, we also mm -hmm. see similar crisis in um, the actual high energy limit. So huh. might you know that um, this uh, spectrum, the resum resummation, would I be able to fix that crisis as well? Well, I, I pr probably am not aware of, of your work. You say that the emission of angular momentum has a similar problem. There is too much angular momentum emission relative to the initial angular momentum. Is that what you're saying? 
Correct. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, definition. yeah. No, I, 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 I don't know your paper, but I presume if you really mean actual, uh, actual emission of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of angular momentum by gravitons, I believe the situation would be very similar. Yeah. So I'm not talking about the order G square, you say it order G cube. This is G cube, correct. G cube, yeah. Not zero frequency gravitons. These yeah, are real so energetic gravitons, right? That's right. If I remember correctly, okay. the leading diversion part is actually coming from the finite energy. So it seems mm -hmm. to me that once you can resume that part of the spectrum, you should mm -hmm. be able to fix this, uh, Absolutely. Crisis. I, yeah, the, uh, yeah. I would be very interested if you can send me the the reference. Uh, is it recent? The, the yes, in this calculation. Maybe a month ago. Okay, okay. I'll look it up. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we have another question from the, from Zoom. Uh, Satya, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, primordial generation of you know, stochastic backgrounds by collisions and so on. Ultra mm. uh, is there a model? I mean, you mentioned the, uh, the one by Weinberg uh, in Sun, but for the early universe, if you have primordial black holes, for instance, is, is it possible that uh, one can see such... Uh, collisions and, and stochastic backgrounds produced. What, what do you have in mind? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. How do yeah, you go well, about using this? Mm -hmm. yeah, this yeah, no, it's a very, very, very good question. And I must say, I, I had this idea while preparing the talk. So, I mean, it's it's really very recent. I was looking into Weinberg. And so no, the idea is not to have primordial black holes. Of course, I mean, that could also be important and interesting. In fact, I'm also thinking about that problem with other people. But no, they, my idea was to say, um, let's consider ultra relativistic scattering since say in the early universe, if you had your soup of elementary particles, you know, at some very high temperature, you have ultra relativistic scattering, which is not only gravitational by the way. Yeah? And these processes, uh, must generate some gravitational waves in the same way as they generate photons. So the, the question would be to, to, to compute that quantity without assuming that there are already black holes, okay? Because, okay, the, the, the idea of primordial black holes is rather that they are formed quite later, not really at the Big Bang, but when the perturbations re-enter the horizon, but you are, uh, then your, your gravitational waves will be extremely high frequency, is that right? Well, uh, they will be produced initially at very high frequency, but they will be redshifting. Red yeah, but even after redshifting, will they not be really high frequency? And uh, w what kind of frequencies do you expect? Well, you know, uh, the CMB is what, in the megahertz? Yeah. So hopefully not in the megahertz because the megahertz is not very accessible to to the detector so you'd have to understand whether somehow you can form a rather uh, softer gravitons so it, it may it may depend on the initial condition on your model for reheating because you see this has to come after inflation right yeah. You know that the big, bang, the big bang happened after inflation, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, so after inflation, you have to see how much reheating you have, uh, which scale of inflation you reach, which energies, which densities, and so on. Is and anyone also, working on this? Is anyone working on the prediction and so on? This would be really interesting for you know, future detectors, even if it is not accessible now. Yeah, no, I don't know of any, but you know, it's so just an idea which together. came to my mind. But I would not, I would be surprised. I, I think it's either a, a crazy, a stupid idea, or somebody must have thought about. So you know, let me be very modest about okay. it. Okay. I mean, I, I'm just asking the question: Can this ultra relativistic collision be 
of some use of some other use for gravitational wave. So it could be an interesting or maybe a problematic background <laughs> of gravitational <laughs> waves. Yeah. yeah. For detection. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we would be very happy to have such a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So on that, let's, uh, thanks Gabriel again. Thank you very much for listening.